here's what you have to know. You are going to have gut check moments. This is God's way or the universe's way of saying, you know, are you worthy of the awesome potential that wholesaling can bring to you? Hey guys and gals, this is Trevor with Investor Carrot coming at you with another Carrot Cast. And on the Carrot Cast, we are always diving into to talk with great entrepreneurs, great real estate investors, great real estate entrepreneurs um, about what they're doing in their business, what they're doing in their life. And uh, we, we really cross between not just the online lead generation side, which of course we focus on the Carrot mainly on our blog, but this cast, this Carrot Cast is really to talk to the entre to entrepreneurs, pull the story out of them, pull their why out of them but also pull out some really, really insanely great nuggets that they are using in their business to grow their business more effectively and more efficiently to serve the life that they want to live. So uh, hopefully you guys in, are enjoying these, these Carrot Casts. This is, I think, number four, number five or something like that. And I've been wanting to talk to Tom uh, for a while now. And uh, Tom, before I officially introduce you and we dive into the Carrot Cast, uh, it's funny, man. So Facebook, uh, you know, Facebook obviously is is the thing that almost everyone checks into you know, at least once a day. And this is probably five, six months ago or something like that. And in a forum that, that I know you're active in on there, um, I'd always see this Tom guy's name come up. Like It seemed like every other day someone was closing a deal with Tom or something happened and Tom showed him how to do it or, or whatever it was. And I was going, this, what is going on with this Tom guy? Like He's everywhere. And I'd never, <laughs> never heard of you before that. And uh, uh, and that doesn't come up often, you know, and, and every time someone would say, hey, well, um, what wholesaling coach out there should I talk to? It was like Tom was the guy that everyone, everyone kept mentioning. So, um, you know, several months passed and then you and I actually got a chance to meet in San Diego, not on purpose. We were just at the same event and we happened to go to the same place for dinner and and um, there weren't enough seats where we were trying to go. And it's like, bam, <laughs> Tom and I were sitting next to each other at dinner and that's kind of how uh, we had a chance to connect. So I'm thankful for those happen chance circumstances. And, and then we had a chance to connect because um, I was telling Andre here and my team and not to make you blush, but like you're one of the favorite guys I've met in the past six months, just your energy, your positivity. Um, it really, it really is contagious. And that's one of the things I love about entrepreneurship is, is connecting with people who are and want to make that difference in the life, in their life and their family's life and other, other people's life and being that beacon of positivity and possibility like we say in our core values. So with that introduction, welcome on the Caracast, man. So happy to have you. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. And I, that was such a, a great introduction. I appreciate that. And I do remember that dinner. Uh, I remember the fried egg right on top of my cheeseburger. <laughs> 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 which was delicious. I don't remember the name of the restaurant in San Diego, but uh, thank you for treating us all to the whole table to dinner. Thank you very yeah. much. And absolutely, it was uh, it was great to spend time with you with you and the team from from Carrot, and it's uh, it's awesome. And Carrot Cast, I love the name. I love it, Carrot Cast. That's great. <laughs> well, good, I, I, I just so I made it up on the fly on our first episode. Literally, I started. I'm like, what am I going to call this thing? <laughs> That's called the awesome. Carrot Cast. So. And in that, in that way too, like I said, I mean, um, we, we really do want, one of my passions is amplifying leaders, is finding people who are out there doing great things and how can we pour that fuel on the fire and help amplify them to make, to have them do a bigger, you know, have them make their bigger impact. And that's what I really want to do on this call is find the leaders like yourself and, and how can we help you make that bigger impact by sharing your story, by sharing tips with people and spreading it out there as far and wide as we can. So as Carrot grows, everyone is out there doing amazing things with their life and making an impact. So Carrot Cast it is, man. That way we can talk about all kinds of stuff too. It doesn't have to be just online lead generation. Um, I love it. I love it. Yeah, and I, I would. I, I love it because it's you know it, this has been such a blessing in my life in such a short amount of time. So the ability to share it with other people and help them succeed is always a blessing, and it's great. And mm -hmm. I, I love doing that. So that's that's awesome. Well, dude, so that, that's a good segue. So I know. Uh, I, I know parts of your story, but I'm really interested to hear kind of a little bit more of, of that startup story. You know, how did you make that transition from the day job? Where, and where'd you come from? And also I would, I, I am also very appreciative that you chose to wear your carrot orange today. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. So, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, you know, it's the same story that every, uh, wholesaler has, right. It's the, uh, the, the sad, you know, got fired, was bankrupt. And, and, uh, the reader's digest version is I was, um, I was working at a job. I was selling uh, lawn care and, uh, I hated it. It was a total nightmare job. I live in Florida and it's hot 
and I'm sweating and I'm going door to door, community to community, trying to sell lawn care services. And uh, it was a total nightmare. I did not enjoy that at all. I got fired. Uh, I went bankrupt. I, I lost all my money. And um, it was a total nightmare. I was able to – luckily I had a uh, – my brother Todd was was a wholesaler in California and I called him up. He's my older brother and I said, Todd, what should I do? And he said, oh, this is it. You got to get into wholesaling. It's going to be great. We're going to crush it. And I said, well, you know, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. <laughs> I said, Todd, you know, you're in San Diego and there's so many houses and they're so big and your assignment fees are so big and I'm in Little Port St. Lucie, Florida and it's so small and there's – not enough houses and you know you know i had all these all these doubts and yeah. and um i mean he dragged me through the mud kicking and screaming the whole time <laughs> and uh i was whining and having pity parties and a debbie downer but uh he didn't give up on me and i i love him for it because it totally uh changed my life i did over 100 assignments in my first 18 months oh, uh it's wholesaling is absolutely i think the greatest uh I, you know i i i everybody always says it's in real estate i i think it's it's not really in real estate. I think it's more of like in the a pawn shop type of industry. But I, I think it's amazing. I, I I love it. I enjoy it every day. I wake up with energy. I wake up on my own. I don't need an alarm clock now. I have a new baby at home who's now, I think, t almost 30 days old. So uh, he keeps me up a little bit. But uh, <laughs> we just, you know, you when you're in that mode, you just it's everything is just a blessing, and it just. It's, there's so much abundance and it's it's fantastic. So I love it and I love sharing it with other people and just getting people results and just getting giving people the information they need to actually do it and take action and get it done. That's the key. So it's uh, it's it's been a great journey and I, I've loved every minute of it. That's amazing, man. And we're gonna you're gonna have a chance to dive in and share a couple amazing tips that are working for you in your business here in a bit. I, I know one of them uh, you're gonna dive into how to double your assignment fees and the other one did you say. Um, how to get to revenue as quickly as possible if you're a newer investor. We're gonna, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so absolutely. We'll, so we'll go into those here in a bit. But you talked about the energy. You talked about the passion. And I know um, for myself, I've got these little kind of quirky things that I do to get myself in that mode or to celebrate some of the things. I need to do a lot better job at celebrating some of those wins as well. But um, the bell behind you. So before <laughs> we hopped on, I asked you, I said, well, I said, how often do you ring that bell? Because sometimes you see things in people's office that are just there right, as a decoration. But I kind of had a feeling that that was more than that because it's by your door. So it's not like hidden in this corner. It's not by your window. It's like by your door where you got to walk by it all the time. And I assume there got to be something there. So why don't you kind of tell <laughs> what the heck is the bell? Like I said, when do you ring that thing? And, and, and what does it do for you psychologically and motivational wise for you? So I love the victory bell and it's hanging right behind me, as you said, and we ring it almost every day. And, you know, and this was something actually that came, um, I, I, I've had it now for, for quite a while. I started when I went through a book called, uh, 10 X by Grant Cardone and, uh, setting big, hairy goals and, and hitting them and then setting a new goal right after that and a new goal right after that and crushing that goal and crushing <laughs> the next goal. So we were always ringing that victory bell when we get a new contract. I'd have the acquisition managers ringing that bell and um, it was amazing. And and something actually where you and I met in person in San Diego, there was a speaker and I, I know his first name I think was Mike and I can't think of his last name. You might have – if you were sitting in that module. But yeah. um, you know, he guy? was talking – yeah, yeah. yeah. And he was talking about success and I really at that conference – and this is why it's so important to get out there and network and network and network all the time and, and go to these type of events. And that was a Ken Clothier event. Um, he talked about what is success? How do you define it? What's a victory? What's a goal? How do you set it? What, you know, What's a good day? And I loved his interpretation. I now adopt it and I use it, which is success is or not end. So. Yeah. What we were saying a moment ago was success for me is if I get to spend a lot of time with my kids and really have a real conversation with them, I'm ringing that victory bell. <laughs> or if marketing goes out on time without me having anything to do with it, we're ringing it. If an assignment fee comes in, we're ringing it. So there's all reasons to be – there's reasons all over the place every day to be grateful and just be thankful and, and ring it because there's so many things that can make your day successful. Uh, and I know when you're first starting out, it's you just want to get that first deal and I get that. Um, but it really starts with an attitude of being grateful. And so we're bringing that thing every day. I'll bring it before we get off the podcast. It's, it's, I need to put it closer to the, to the microphone though, because it's too, I can't reach it from here, but you'll get to hear it ring before we, uh, before we hang up for sure. Man, that's, that's, that's one of the, the really important things that you mentioned there. You know, when, when, 
when we just start our journey in whatever it is, it could be you know starting a real estate company or it could be you know, whatever, you're running a marathon and getting out there and running that first run or running that next one and pushing through when you didn't want to. Um, and the, the, those those little things in life are things that we need to celebrate. Like you said, it's not it's not um, if I get here, then I will be happy. It's not that at all. You know, it's it's the, right. it's it's being grateful about what you have now, and um, it's not the if then uh, uh, formula. And I read a book. It was called um, the, it's called Happiness at Work or Happiness Something. And I met the author down in Costa Rica and. Uh, I'm going to completely butcher his name, but it's Sri Kumar Rao or something like that. I've got the book back okay. somewhere. But <laughs> in, anyway, the one thing I took away from it was very similar to what you're mentioning. It's so powerful is too many people are stuck in the if I hit this or when I hit this goal, then I can be happy. So it's if then, right. it's the if then mindset. And I know when I was living like that in, in, my, you know, in my life, and sometimes, it, sometimes I'll catch myself too going, okay, I'm in that I'm in that mind space. I need to pull back and let's do a gratitude check right now. You know, Absolutely. Because it is so easy to get caught in the, the goal and go, okay, I'm not going to be fully fulfilled and happy until I until I hit that. And that's the opposite of why I think most of us of us become entrepreneurs. It's not so we can be um, it, it's so we can be free, but the thing is we mentally imprison ourselves with these goals and we're not gonna be happy until we get there. So that's huge right there, man. That the bell, the victory bell. Everyone on the call, come up with your own version of Victor Victor Rebel, whatever it is, and celebrate right. those little things. Well, you know, and it's true. It's a good point. I, I I actually went out to dinner last night with a client who came. He actually, uh, you know, he came down to see me, and we went out to dinner, and he was saying, you know, well, I I was saying, well, you know, you're doing enough business now. You should hire an acquisition manager. You should hire a VA to do your marketing, and we were having that conversation. He said, well, you know. He said, "Well, I'm 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 so afraid. I have so much fear to do that. And I think a lot of that is really fear, right? But um, th- this is really all based in fear. This, you know, this whole not wanting to, you know, really have enjoyment or fulfillment until you hit a goal, uh, and then not hitting that goal, right? It's like a self-imposed thing of fear here. But, um, you know, the real the truth is, is you can encourage somebody and you can motivate them. But the really the truth is." There's a lot of arrogance in that fear. There's a lot of arrogance because when you're afraid, when you're sitting there at a restaurant and you're eating dinner and you're healthy and your children are healthy and you're married and you have a good marriage and you're driving a car, you know, there are people who are, you know, the the truth of the matter is there are things to be afraid of. There are moments where you have to have courage and sending out your marketing and risking some money to do that or sending out, you know, getting an acquisition manager and getting a little bit uncomfortable to have that growth, that is not fear. You don't have the right to be afraid of that. That's not real fear. You're not sitting, God forbid, bedside with one of your children, God forbid, and, and trying to help them through. And that's really what this comes down to. You didn't come back from Iraq with no legs and, and have that challenge. So there are, it's very, I think it's prideful to be afraid because you, you, you have to just say, what is the worst possible consequence if I, if I have this growth or if I have that victory and you know, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? And the reality is when you say, what's the worst thing that's going to happen, you're still going to eat you're still going to have a roof over your head. You're still going to have a car and a wife and a family or whatever your situation is. And, you know, you have to be careful of that because when you're not grateful, it could be, you know, you have to kind of fight through that and fight it because those fears only get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I know that you don't, you don't want God or the universe or whatever your belief system is to actually give you opportunities to have courage. Yeah. I'd rather not have that opportunity. <laughs> so I think it's, I think it's really important to look at it also like, you know, from that, from that angle. Yeah, dude, that's I, I could talk on that stuff all day. We we might have to have you come back literally and just have us talk about mindset and things like that. Absolutely, I could talk about it all day. So you mentioned acqu- acquisition manager. Um, what what is what does your team look like right now? What did it look like maybe the first six months of you diving? So you did you said you did a hundred assignments in the first eighteen months, right? So right. what does your team look like now? What did it look like maybe in month six? <laughs> So my uh, when I first started, so uh, um, my fir- my team right now is myself. Um, I don't really, I'm, I'm very blessed that I don't have anything really to do with my wholesaling business really at all. I, I have um, something called KPI reports, which are for anybody who's not sure, just stands for key performance indicators. Um, they just tell me where the business is. I look at those on Wednesday and Friday, but the business does run without me, which I am 
blessed to have. Um, I have acquisition managers and I have a full-time assistant and a full-time marketing uh, person. The marketing person and the assistant are overseas. And, um, and that's all we do is just, you know, wholesaling is very, very easy. People, you know, I always say wholesaling is easy. Wholesalers are complicated. If you could just get out of your own way, I mean, you know, anybody, a child could wholesale anything. You could wholesale a car, you know, we happen to do houses, but it's really a commodity. If you, Put something, you know, wholesaling. I always say the only education you need in wholesaling is you find a motivated seller with equity, you put their house under contract, and you sell the contract. That's, yeah. you know, it's, it's not rocket science. <laughs> if I could do it, anybody could do it. I can tell you that for sure. Um, when I first started, it was all grit, determin- ter- determination, perseverance, getting over all of the, you know, the all of the gut check moments, and it was just me. I had no access to MLS, and you know, this is, this is such a good point because. So many people put so many things in front of their success for wholesaling and in front of that deal. And they put things like, you know, hey, where are you at? And oh, well, I'm working on Podio and I'm almost done. I'm six weeks in and and I just have to move this one field. And I'm like, well, how many deals have you done? They're like, well, I haven't done a deal yet. Yeah. That's a major problem. You know, or they're designing a logo or they're yeah. designing a business card. So I think, um, you know, for me, as it was just me when I first started off, I didn't have, I only had access to Zillow for like the first almost full year of my business. I didn't have access to MLS. You don't, there's, when, when you hit rock bottom and, you know, for me, when I got fired and claimed bankruptcy, my wife was, I came home one day and she was crying in the shower and I, you know, I, I heard her in the bathroom crying and she had shut the door. She was crying and she was worried about, you know, the mortgage and paying bills and, when you hit that moment, all of the logo and the podio and all of that just goes away. Mm-hmm. And now you realize you just have to go out and do a deal because the truth of the matter is, and I know it's I know it's elementary, and I know it's amateurish and kind of silly, but if someone kidnapped your children and you had to wholesale a deal to get your kids back, that was the ransom, I guarantee you you would wholesale a deal in a week yeah. or less. Probably yeah. 72 hours. But people they they they're not they're they're not in that mindset so it's like it's like oh let's design a pretty logo and start like a blog about cash to attract cash buyers yeah, <laughs> it's it, like it, no 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 don't do that <laughs> no it, exactly it's it, and we, we we run into that quite a bit with carrot of course and and of course we help people generate leads online and and there's all these little steps that do you know there, there's some things that, that do need to come before you can get some traffic to it, right? You have to push a button and launch a site. You gotta attach a domain name and maybe tweak up a little bit of the content. But you don't even have to do that. And and we'll we will find people who are like you said, month you know, they're they're week four or week six or month three in and they're still making adjustments to their website. And we always push right. them push them back and say, hey, we, we always go for progress, not perfection. And we're like, let's move through the phases as quick as we can. You can always adjust things as you go. You can always add a logo in month eight. And if you want to, you can always you tweak your content later or whatever it is, but it's, I think just looking back on my own journey, cause I, I had done that exact thing for about a year before I actually took action buying my first property, researching and this and that, and it was kind of the, the, um, the just in case versus just in time learning process. Right. I heard that phase, that phrase <laughs> years ago. That. Yeah. It's like I was I learning, that. learning things just in case I would need to know them someday. And right. um, instead of learning the thing, the next thing that I needed just in time to use it and not clouding my mind with three things, three steps ahead. And as soon as I started doing that, um, it got me into that mode where you, you can catch momentum. You can, you can, you're right. starting to knock off those things once at, one at a time instead of stepping on stair two and then trying to jump up to stair eight. It's really hard to make that jump. But if you step to stair three and stair four and stair five, you're there before you know it. It took less effort. Um, it's you know, just an amazing mindset stuff uh, with that. And I think your service is the key. I mean, that's the whole, the answer is, you know, carrot, because you, you don't, you know, don't, you, you, what, what you, when you have the maturity and the realization as a visionary and an entrepreneur and being creative and, and being at 40,000 feet, you start to realize like, hey, I shouldn't be figuring out SEO. Let's just go to Trevor. He's already got it done. I yeah. mean, and, and and that's not like a plug. That's the reality of the situation. It is it is ludicrous to go down and get a book about SEO for dummies mm-hmm. when there is a service right there that has it's a completely done for you service. And I think that's you know, you, but you don't know this stuff when you first start, and you can you know. So and I don't mean to be in a in a in a um, you know. I know it's a little blunt to you know. But you have to sometimes have that realization when you're when you're sitting there trying to do a deal and you're not sure why you're not doing it and you're playing with podio fields. It's like that's the reason, you know, the CRM doesn't produce the deal. So that's yeah. I think you know key to start. 
It, and one thing, and then we'll dive into the two tips. One thing on that too that popped in my mind is oftentimes it's it's the low resistance activities that we get stuck on. You know, it's the things that it's those things that really are easy to do. They don't provide a whole lot of resistance, but we keep on doing them because it's not this big risk. It's not this big mental risk we're taking. There's not much oh, of a risk. Bad, yeah. There's not much of a risk to pay our logo guy 200 bucks to get a logo done, but paying that same 200 bucks to or 500 bucks or whatever it is to do a little your first test of a direct mailing piece. That's putting yourself out there. There's there's a possibility of failure in someone's mind. There's no possibility of failure for that 200 bucks to go to the logo guy because you know you're going to get the logo back. And that's right. something we just have to all get over. Is is those little possibilities of failure aren't you know are, they aren't failures? They're this is very cliche, but it's kind of like I was talking with Andre um, yesterday. She used to do a lot of door to door sales, and they their close ratio was one in thirty, right? And it was kind of wow. Well, that's someone would look at that and go, oh my gosh, that's just totally defeating. But when you're knocking on doors, you know that every no is getting you closer to that next yes kind of thing. So. Um, Failures are not failures. They're just another step in the process to hitting that uh, first success. Just another result, and and that is so true about the lowest resistant activity. I, I never really thought of it in that way, but everything that you want is on your the other side of your comfort zone, and that's like I that is so true that when you know when you take the time to work on stuff that's easy, um, and and I think also a lot of people fall into that trap because entrepreneurs, founders, and visionaries have a tendency to be very creative people. They're actually like very artistic. So those projects are very appealing and you could, you could deep dive it for three weeks yeah. and, you know, not see the sun and, you know, you're fooling around with like high rise fields or whatever it is. And, you know, it's, it's ludicrous. So it's, uh, but when you, you know, that's why I think so many, so many good wholesalers have hit rock bottom because when you hit rock bottom, it's like, no, that's it. It's, we got to get a deal. It's like, there's no other way or I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, so this is a really good transition point. So one of the things that you're known for, of course, is helping people get their first deal done really effectively. And of course, you've done a lot of deals and you can, you can show people how to scale and how to automate their business and step out of it and things like that. But we're going to talk about two things today, two quick tips. So one of them is going to be getting to revenue as quickly as possible if you're newer. And then the next thing is going to be how do you double your assignment fees if you've already got some deals coming in. So let's start with getting to revenue. Um, if someone was brand new or maybe they've done their first deal, but then it's been a little while since they were able to get that next one, they're starting to think, shoot, was that a fluke? You know, um, is this harder than I thought it was going to be? Or they just haven't got that first deal. What would you tell them to do if you were if they were sitting there in your office and they were in that situation where you knew that they were going to take action they had they maybe were at their rock bottom or they were just ready to make it happen what are the things that you would tell them to do so this is so key i think that Here's the bottom line. The first thing you have to do is you have to start with a proven system. There's no question about that. You have to find a way to do it, right? So the first thing you have to do is identify some way that has been done before you and have that roadmap. Um, and then what you have to realize is that once you pick a roadmap that you're going to follow, and, and this is not the time to be a trailblazer. This is not the time to be the founder or entrepreneur or visionary. This is the time to be the follower and to find a roadmap that's already proven. Don't reinvent the wheel is the number one piece of advice. Um, because as entrepreneurs, right, what's the first thing I did? Oh, Todd told me to use his postcard. You know what? I don't like this one thing. Let me just scratch this off and I'm going to yeah. change that. I mean, now looking back, ludicrous. Don't yeah. change the postcard. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> right? So, so it's, it's, um, first you got to find the way, the, the map. As soon as you do that, um, here's the deal. When you start wholesaling, if anyone is out there and they're listening in and they're, they're listening to this and they're, they're just getting started, here's what you have to know. You are going to have gut check moments. This is God's way or the universe's way of saying, you know, are you worthy of the awesome potential that wholesaling can bring to you? Um, we call these gut check moments, the, these hurdles, um, the three D's. Uh, the first one you're going to have to deal with is doubt. Doubt is going to come up and it's going to be all that like childhood doubt. Like, are you worthy? Are you good enough? Are you good looking enough? Are you, you know, 
they can do it, but can you do it? And um, that's going to be something that's going to definitely come up to try to hinder your ability to do this. Because really, again, wholesaling is very easy. Wholesalers are complicated. There's nothing hard about wholesaling, so it's just getting out of your own way. Uh, so doubt's the first one. The second one with doubt is the other kind of doubt you have is territory doubt, right? This is the same thing. Everybody who comes into wholesaling, if you're in a big city, you're like, oh, the people in the small towns are so lucky. There's no competition and da da da. And then the people in the small towns are like, oh, the people in a big city are so lucky. There's more houses and the yeah. Simon fees are bigger. So you have territory doubt. Um, and then you're going to have doubt about wholesaling itself, especially if you haven't done a deal yet. You know, so people will say, well, you know, I, you know, Tom, I don't even understand this. Why would someone ever pay? Why would someone ever sell their home for pennies on the dollar when they can just call a real estate agent and get full price? And you know, it, it takes time to understand as a wholesaler, what your services actually are, because a lot of people get into it and they, they don't really understand what the services are that wholesalers um, have to offer. So the first D is doubt. You've got to get over. Uh, as soon as you get over doubt, the second one is disappointment, right? And I know, and I know Trevor, you know, if you're in real estate investing in any niche of real estate investing, wholesaling or not, you're going to have tons of disappointment. Oh, yeah. Um, just like you were saying with the no's, it takes 30 no's to get a yes. In wholesaling, it's more like 100. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, there's going to be tons of disappointment. There's going to be sellers who are um, – there's going to be sellers who are going to want to pull out of deals. And there, there's going to be agents who are telling you that it's not legal to wholesale. And there's all kinds of those hurdles that are going to be um, coming up against you. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last one, of course, the last hurdle, the last gut check moment that you have to get over is distraction. This yep. is uh, this is definitely the stage four terminal killer, which is um, distraction can be as soon as you start your journey, you have a personal distraction um, where you have to stop and you have to go out of town or something happens. It can be um, it could be the one where it's like you're really not comfortable taking action until you know. So you get into the tailspin of education, which is they call it analysis paralysis, right? This one's like a this is a killer, right? Like a total killer of new wholesalers. Yeah. Um, another popular distraction is shiny object syndrome, which I'm still guilty of. You know, you know, oh, don't wholesale. You should flip bulk REO deals. You can make more money in less time. It's like, oh, that's great. Tell me more about that. It's like, well, wait a second. Wait a second. Don't go anywhere yet. It's like we haven't even done one deal yet. So um, so what I always encourage people to do is the first thing is when you're getting started and you have these hurdles, you have these gut check moments, the first thing you've got to do is just pause for a moment. Recognize that this is a hurdle. Recognize it for what it is. Um, and then the second thing I always recommend to do is um, you got to deal with it. So get a little egg timer, set it for three minutes. You can have a little pity party. You can, um, you know, blame me, blame yourself, blame your spouse, blame your, you know, kids, blame your high school coach. It doesn't matter who you blame. But what I can tell you for sure is that it is in those moments of frustration where you are going to find your greatness. Yeah. It's it's in those moments of losing heart where you are gonna have success. So I really wanna encourage anybody who's just starting that when you are having these things come up against you, you've got to make it happen. It's That is right at that moment when you're so close, you've gotta double down, you've gotta, You've you've got to you got to punch the gas and not pump the brake. You've got to make that next phone call, book that next appointment, send that next offer because it's right at that moment where you're you're just about to make it happen and you don't want to quit right then. Mm -hmm. So that would be my best advice for for new people who are just kind of just right out of the gate and they want to go right to revenue. Man, and, and the crazy thing is you talk about pushing through. You know when it's getting really hard. That's the point. Whenever people ask me what's the number one difference between someone who succeeds in X and fails in X. And usually it's not their knowledge, it's not how smart they are, it's usually not the resources, it's usually that they stopped before the other person did. Um, Absolutely. That the other person kept going when it got hard and they, and they, they continued with the mindset of, um, you know, it's if, you know, it's, not, it's not if, it's when this happens, it's not if. And that was kind of right. for me too when I, when I got out of college, moved up to Portland. The first year I was like, I'm just not going to get a job, I'm just going to try to figure this thing out. And it was tough, but the, the one thing that carried me through was I knew it was going to happen because I had the confidence of just good people around me, and I just felt that it was going to happen. I had no clue how or when. And as soon as I switched my mindset from, oh my gosh, it, you know, is this ever going to work? You know, is, it, it, I wonder if this is going to work kind of thing, to it's not if, but when. That's the right. only variable is time, is time and how. 
and that's it. And uh, as soon as I made that mindset shift, man, it's like you feel really empowered and you're not going to stop because there's no reason Absolutely. to stop because you know you're going to get it. It's just Absolutely. you just got to find out how and then figure out how long it's going to take. I love it. It's so true. It's so easy, but it's so hard. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is big time. So on, on the, the – the, I guess before we dive into how to double your assignment, I've got one quick question. Um, so at the start, you talked about finding that path, finding the proven path, finding something that's worked before you. And some people may be going, well, shoot, you know, what is that thing? Now, there isn't one magic bullet. I know people like you who do a lot of direct mail and it's working insanely well. And you're probably doing some other things too. Um, I know people who just do online stuff and it's working very well. I know people who, there's a guy here in Oregon who's crushing with bandit signs. Like literally driving here in Roseburg, Oregon, which is a small town. He lives in a completely different town. He has two to three types of bandit signs out at any given time, different phone numbers. They look completely different. And he has people scattering the state with these things. And he's crushing it, it. doing 10 deals a Love month. It. So that, the, the, I think if, if people are coming on this call looking for send out this exact postcard to this exact list and do this and do that and have this person answer it and say this, that that's not really what you guys need. You guys need to find someone or something that has that system that is proven and just plug into that. Um, whatever it is, whatever it is that's going to work right. in your market. It doesn't have to be, if someone listens to Tom saying direct mail is crushing it, direct mail might crush it for you. Give that a go. Work with Tom or work with someone who has that system. Um, but find what it is that's right for you. And then as you perfect that, then you stack on the other things to scale. Um, but what, what is it, if you had to name you know, your top two or three things for you, um, just broad-based, what is it that's bringing in your deals now, marketing-wise? So, so here's the secret, right, to this answer is that um, the real answer is that it, it for and I'll tell you, I'll definitely tell you what mine is, but the answer is what you just said about bandit signs, where you said you drive everywhere and you just see his bandit signs everywhere and he has three variations, right? So, the real answer here is that when you do your marketing, whatever marketing channel you choose, you cannot, and this is, if you ask people, if you ask 10 people who are not doing deals and you ask 10 people who are, you're going to get exactly um, that same response, which is this. The people who are not doing deals or very few deals or they're on that income roller coaster, they are doing a little bit of a lot of different channels. Mm -hmm. Like, what did you do today? Well, I put out 20 bandit signs and I also called, called Craigslist and I also did this and I also did that and I, I hand wrote 20 letters. Mm -hmm. So my advice is, Whatever marketing channel you choose, you have got to be number one. If you choose bandit signs, you've got to go to the dumpster if you don't have any money and you got to get cardboard signs and you have got to make so many bandit signs that you don't even get a fine. You go straight directly to jail because you put out so many you actually got put into prison because you can't dip your toe in the water. You've got to jump all in. You've yeah. got to be the guy. So. Uh, for me, it, it was when I started and still is today. Um, you could take away some of my channels, but direct mail's definitely been my number one channel. Mm -hmm. um, some of the lists that I like are equity list. I like um, tax delinquent list. I love code violation list. There's a whole different sequence that we do um, for code violations. We like arrest record lists. We like, um, you know, there's all sorts of lists that we like. Um, we have about 10 lists that we use in the side of our tribe. But the bottom line is whatever marketing piece you use, you've got to be number one um, in that marketing piece, it, for that marketing piece in that channel. Uh, and then this way you're going to get the deals. So, um, and a lot of that is 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 either seasonal or uh, uh, territorial. You know, it depends on where you are. It's, uh, ge uh, it's based on geography or it's based on your budget. Yeah. But uh, we we like direct mail for sure. Is 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 um, you know, one of my you know our main ones for sure. I, I love it. And I'll, I'll recap that, and then we're gonna dive into tip two, which is how to uh, double your assignment fee. So on the recap on on that, the big takeaway here, guys and gals, this is not just for new investors. What Tom just mentioned there, this is for anyone who wants to do better and scale their business as well, is do more of that marketing that's working. Or even if, even if it's not working, I remember when we were in San Diego, you mentioned that uh, you know a year or two ago that you guys were able to send out, I may not be using the exact numbers, but let's say a thousand postcards to get X amount of deals or leads, right? Or right. Letters or whatever you guys are doing. And now you're sending out like 5,000 to get an equal amount. And of course the market's changed, but what, what we'll see a lot of people doing we see the same thing on, on um, SEO or pay-per-click, where as markets change, people go, oh, shoot, I'm getting fewer leads now with my same pay-per-click budget. This must not be working as well. I'm going to stop it. When 
you're not going, oh, direct mail is not working as good. I'm going to stop it. You go, let me ramp it up. Let me ramp Absolutely. it up. Absolutely. Um, Bam. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know it. <laughs> let me ramp it up. So that's, that's a huge takeaway for anyone doing any kind of marketing is as you hit those walls, markets shift. Okay. It may not be your marketing. It may not even be that there's so many other wholesalers in the market. Uh, it could be that the market shifted. It became a seller's market where now sellers are, are able to list and get 10 above, above asking price offers. And, and it makes right. it so, so the we buy houses type message may not resonate to as many people. Who knows? Who knows what it is? But the market shifted. You just have to double down and do more of that thing and crack through. Same thing with paper. Because we had a, an email that came through uh, uh, just yesterday. Brandon on our team I was managing this guy's paper quick in New Orleans. Um, and the guy doubled down on that, ramped it up, and he closed two deals. He said in the past, I mean, it was within the past four to six weeks uh, that netted him 40K. And I'm like, okay. 40K. So that's, that's on, that's on pay per click or on, on SEO? On pay per click in New Orleans. So, Woo! Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I was looking at him, that's the stuff that we love to see. But the huge key there, the huge key there is someone else in a different market looking at it, God, it's because he's in New Orleans it's working. No, it's because he doubled down and didn't skimp on budget. He's like, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to try pay-per-click. I'm going to do pay-per-click, you know, and Damn. it's going to work. So same 40K, thing. We, we, we got to ring the victory bell for that. You yeah, ready? Yeah, dude, do it. All right, it. let's do it. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> victory bell. I love it. <laughs> I love it, man. There's that beautiful victory bell. I love it. <laughs> Dude, that's amazing. We need, we need, hey, Andre, we need to get a victory bell in here. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. It, get a big one. I like the it. Bigger the, I love it. But that's, that's awesome. That's, that's awesome. No, that's yeah, cool, good man. stuff. So let's dive into doubling your assignment fee and then we'll wrap it up because I know I'm running a little bit over time here. But I, uh, dude, that's, this conversation has been awesome. So I kept on wanting to dive in with you. Doubling awesome. your assignment fee. So someone's doing some deals and they want to scale their business up. There's several ways to scale any business up, right? There's to sell more of that thing to the same person. There's to sell other things to the same person or increase your margins. So what we're talking about here is increasing your margins. Um, how do you double your assignment fees? How do you increase those so assignment fees? The good news is this is like no fluff, no BS. So everybody should get out a pen and paper because I'm going to give you actual tips and tricks to do this right now that it will work today. I'm going to tell you two ways that you can do it. It's very easy um, that are going to actually at the minimum double. But and we've had people who've now tripled and quadrupled their assignment fees for this. So the biggest tragedy, Trevor, is – as a wholesaler, we work so hard to find these deals and then we just give them away to our cash buyers, right? We just like give them away and um, very frequently to the wrong people. Um, and so we're working harder and harder to find these deals and then we're just giving them away. And we call that in our tribe, we call that being a CBE, which is buyer employee. So what you've done is you, you know, you quit your job and you just became a CBE, which is like, okay, um, now I'm just going to work for a handful of cash buyers. And yeah. that is wrong. And we don't allow it in our tribe. No CBEs <laughs> allowed. So, um, there's, there's, um, the way to think about this is this, if you're a wholesaler right now and you're wholesaling, pretend that you have a PA in your back pocket, you walk into a room and, uh, there's three tables at the first table, you have a, a, a landlord and this landlord, she buys every, she has every property in town and she's been landlording for 25 years. And she knows that she's what a lot of wholesalers, um, would call like a proven buyer, which scares the heck out of me. That's the first one. <laughs> The second one would be a rehabber who is like the biggest rehabber in town. He's got he's, – he's, he rehabs 200 properties a year. He's the guy, right? Proven buyer. Yeah. And then you have John and Sally Smith and they're buying their first investment property through a real estate agent. My question for you is who do you think is going to pay you the most money for that purchase agreement? Yeah. That's the question. Yeah. And obviously, you know, the answer is the agent with the, with the new cash buyers. Yeah. The bottom line is, is that your cash buyers should look, act, feel, taste, touch, and sound exactly like your sellers, your motivated sellers. Mm -hmm. Motivated sellers have certain things in common. So do the best cash buyers. Um, motivated sellers, they are um, number one. They don't have usually a lot of cash. They're kind of in a pinch and they need to make a fast decision. They don't normally have a tremendous amount of real estate expertise and knowledge, and they are usually in a very uh, – they're in a time – uh, position. So our services, if you know what your services are as a wholesaler, you can service those people. It's exactly the same as a pawn shop. Why does somebody bring a Rolex to a pawn shop instead of putting it on eBay and waiting two weeks? Yep. It's the exact same scenario. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind and knowing that, um, that your highest paying cash buyer is going to be the new investor 
who is um, using a, a, an agent, the first thing that you have to do is you have to see, you have to find cash buyers who look like your motivated sellers. Number one, they don't have a ton of cash. So usually people who are buying their first investment property, uh, they're usually buying it through an agent and they're usually borrowing their money from like a father, grandfather, mother, sister, whoever it is, or it's a group of people. So the first thing that you should do is get as many agents on your cash buyer list as possible. Just remember this, make a big sign, Put it above your desk. The highest paying cash buyers come through real estate agents. That's mm. number one. The second, uh, the second rule is that they need to, um, they need to uh, not have, they need to be on a timeline, and and this is the key. Um, we developed a system, and you could create one, which is we force our buyers to play by our rules. We do not work for the cash buyers, so we force them to bid on our on our purchase agreement. If you want to get in our property, then if you want to get our, our purchase agreement, then you need to bid on our purchase agreement. We don't just take a price and start negotiating. Yeah. We only stop negotiating on that purchase agreement when we have a signed assignment and, um, and a non-refundable deposit. So how do we recreate the scenario on the front end the same way we do on the back end? Number one, we, the, Always remember this, and this is another sign that, that if you're listening to this, you should make the wholesaler with the biggest and the most responsive cash buyer list wins. So have the biggest, gnarliest, most responsive cash buyer list in the world. In your whole county, you have the biggest one. So constantly be building that list and then a ton of real estate agents and brokers on that list and then make your buyers bid on that purchase agreement. Mm -hmm. Stop just bringing a deal – and 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 saying, hey, John, you know, what do you think you can give me for this deal? Because now you're a cash buyer employee or a CBE, which we yeah. don't want to do, because that produces a job, and that's yeah. we're here to be owners, not not have you know, not sit in a cubicle again. Yeah, and and you're do, doing it that way too. You know, doing it where you know you only have two, three, four cash buyers. You're sending all your deals to. You're 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 really doing it the way that they want you to do it for sure, because they don't want the competition. You know, if, Absolutely. I, if I was that cash buyer, I'd be like, dude, just send them all to me first, and I'll pay you a little bit more because I'm getting them first. But my little bit more uh -huh. is nowhere near as, as much as when we create demand for it like you guys are doing. You um, walk into a RIA meeting, and those guys are patting you on the back, and they're like, oh, this is Tom. He's my guy. He brings me all my deals, and he's smiling ear to ear. You are losing a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, good a point. lot of money. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Well, shoot, absolutely. man. Those tips are amazing. So hopefully people wrote wrote down some notes, uh, whether you're listening to this on the podcast or watching the video. And and Tom, how, how can people uh, learn more from you? How can they find you? I know you have an amazing podcast. You have great content. Where can people find you? Yeah, so we have a, a website called Wholesaling Inc. It's uh, www.wholesalinginc.com. Uh, we have a podcast that's focused on wholesaling where we interview our tribe members, talk about the deals. No fluff, no BS, just straight uh, information for wholesaling revenue and how to produce it and get it quick and keep it. So um, yeah, absolutely. Check us out on wholesalinginc.com. And and uh, yeah, we'd love to we'd love to uh, give you some awesome information. One last question for you. <laughs> One last question for you before we go. So... I know with, with Carrot, one of the things that makes it really fulfilling for me to grow our company and to want to continue to grow it, um, it, it it's not the revenue, it's not the finances, right? There's got to be this why behind what you're doing. And I think a why shifts, it changes. The why at the start is to get out of bankruptcy, as an example, or it's to, you know, it's to, it's to have money in the bank so you guys don't have to worry about the money. What, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot, what is it right now that's hitting you in your gut that's like in, in a good way that this is your why? This is why you keep on doing more deals. This is why you are doing this podcast. Like why are you taking this 35 minutes we've been on the call away from your brand new baby and wife and getting your message out there? You know, it's so funny when I um, I when I first started wholesaling, my very first month, I I went to Atlanta and Todd, uh, my brother, paid for me to go, and it was a Sean Terry conference in Atlanta, and I met some amazing people there. I met people I'm still friends with today, uh, like Nazar a library from uh, North Carolina, and just other amazing individuals that I'm I'm still friends with today, Luis and. Um, you know, I remember when Sean Terry started the conference, he was he was talking about his why, like what's your why, what's your why? And I was like, Oh my goodness, what is he talking about? Like, yeah. bro, I need to make money. Like I am totally <laughs> broke. I don't have time for a why right now. And I remember thinking that it's so funny because, you know, when I was there, um, 
when I was there, uh, three different people within a 48 hour period recommended this book to me called the four spiritual laws of prosperity, mm-hmm. which, um, in my tribe is now required reading. You've got to read it. It's not, it's, uh, it's required, but, um, and I remember that people were talking about tithing and, and, you know, giving back and things like that. And that from that point to today, I will tell you that my why is, um, and it may be silly to some people, but I can tell you, I want to be the number one largest giver in my church. That is my why. So I am going to bust my butt to do it. That is my driving <laughs> force. Um, I will tell you that as a, you know, and, and I know it's like, it sounds a little crazy, but I will tell you that for me personally, I'm a Christian and tithing has really increased my faith and it is such a awesome feeling Mm -hmm. right like you know doubting thomas right so it's appropriate that my name is thomas but um (laughs) you know this whole idea of tithing and then you know when you have an abundance mindset instead of a scarcity mindset and you give and give and give and then you give more and more um and it's like my cup just keeps flowing over and over and i'm like i love it (laughs) So I just want to like give and give and give and give and give and like I love the book The Go-Giver. I love the Four Spiritual Laws of Prosperity. I think, you know, it's one thing. I thought it was like a bunch of fluff and BS when I first heard Sean talk about it. But Sean is so blessed and, you know, having that introduction when I first got started and like meeting those people who are awesome, you know, charitable and tithing and giving people. um, This whole journey for me has not been about the money and the finances. It's been about meeting amazing people, people like you, Trevor, people like tribe members. We have like, I mean, just amazing people, like people who like, they come from, like they go into debt and now they're like making, you know, 20, 40, $80,000 per month. I mean, it's incredible. I love it. So I think that that's really, that's my number one goal right now is that that's what we're, that's what we're going towards. I, so, I love it, it, man. I, I love it. I love it. And, and like I said, I love your energy. Keep, keep that going, dude. And, and be that beacon of positivity and possibility. Uh, for you and your tribe and your family and your church and everyone around you. So thanks, Tom, for, for coming on the call, dude. It was a really great call. I know people got a lot out of it from newer investors to people who want to scale up. Uh, any parting words before we go? Just make it happen. And I, that's, if I have one parting word for anybody who's just starting or they want to get off the roller coaster and have a business that's automated, fear is arrogance and pride. Make it happen. Do it as if, and I know it sounds silly and elementary, but do it as if you're paying the ransom to get a loved one back. And I and I know that sounds silly, but if you put yourself in that mindset, I couldn't fly to your city and stop you from doing a deal if I tried. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really just understand this is a mindset problem. This is not a wholesaling problem. This is not an information problem. This is a just getting out there and making it happen problem. I love it. Tom, thank you, man, for hopping on. And everyone, uh, thank you for joining us on this Carrot Cast. And go out there and take action. Go out there and whatever it is, scale up your business, start your business. Uh, Go out there and spread whatever it is that you're passionate about to other people with the business as your platform and be that beacon of positivity and possibility in your community, your life, whatever it is you care about. So thank you guys. Have an amazing week and thanks, Tom.